Thank you for uh, coming. My name is Ukman Ulal. I'm with Columbia University, with the Department of Earth and Environmental Engineering and the Columbia Water Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome this invitation-only crowd here. We are very pleased that you guys could join us. The topic before us is America's water. Uh, it's a topic that is dear to our hearts, but it's not altogether clear to me that there is the sort of focus on the topic that it warrants. Uh, we look at many things around the world on water, and we feel that in America we are well endowed with water, so we are not the ones who should worry about it. It's the women walking five kilometers to fetch water in the Sudan that gets some attention, deservedly so, but I think we should look at our own situation as well. Um, we live in interesting times. Uh, I watch a show called Morning Joe while I do my morning exercises, and Jeff Sachs, I think he's here somewhere, he's on it off and on, and it's an interesting dialogue because these are people who are Republicans and Democrats, and I'm ad advertising their show, I should get a commission. Uh, so, but what comes out as an undercurrent is that we are in a funny time when our leaders don't seem to be able to distinguish between what are real issues and what are not real issues. Uh, the public seems to, but not those people. And in that category, if we look at water, one of the interesting things that comes out is that while we take it for granted, the reasons that we take it for granted are under challenge. The American Society of Civil Engineers updated their report on infrastructure, which is what makes us take things for granted, and the grades are very interesting. They range between a D minus and a D plus for the different facets of infrastructure. You can debate whether those make sense in the same way that ranking Columbia as the fourth best university in the world or in the United States makes sense. But regardless of that, there are a couple of numbers that they throw out which are interesting, particularly from a business perspective, and which is why we have brought, brought this group together. Their number for drinking water infrastructure repairs and renovation is $1 trillion. And again, you can argue whether this makes any sense or not. Uh, and their number for wastewater is around $300 billion. And then you add dams and levees, and you're over $1.5 trillion. So that money is apparently not there. But that besides the point, if that's the situation that we are launching ourselves into, one question that comes to my mind is, if you're going to spend that kind of money, do you want to spend that kind of money on renewing exactly the same business model that you have had, or should there be thinking radically changing what we should do with the technology side of it, the governance side of it, and the reason to do that is not just ourselves, the global context part of the statement that we have had in framing this particular conversation says that what we pride ourselves on in America is A, we are a nation of immigrants, what do these immigrants come here to do? They come here to innovate. So let's do that. And then it becomes a global issue. And the, the, it's time that we take the leadership that we have and express it worldwide. Uh, and that's the, the framing of this particular conversation, essentially. Uh, in that conversation, I recognize that the environment plays a role and the resources play a role. By the environment, I refer to the energy issues that capture our hearts nowadays. I also refer to the ecology, and we, have, we are well past the time when there was a debate about whether or not ecology was important. We recognize that. We recognize that in as much as we recognize that human health relates to drinking water, that the streams and rivers that we have relate to the things that we value. So the questions that we are framing in the two panels today, the first one is purposely focused at looking at what should be the future of urban water infrastructure? And here, the framing that I discussed with some of the panelists who are here is to look at not just drinking water and wastewater issues, but also floods, storm waters, and so forth, and how one can manage or redesign the urban infrastructure so as much as possible, we capitalize on the opportunity of managing the total urban water cycle. There's no doubt that many cities will have to bring in water from outside and other rivers anyway. But the question is how far can you get and can you make it into a business model where we look at distributed as well as centralized infrastructure and governance models that could then be models for the highly urbanizing emerging markets as well as our own.
Okay? It's not a question that we already have this infrastructure. We already agreed that that infrastructure is failing. So it's a time to rethink that aspect. The second conversation is about an interesting piece which we are calling risks and opportunities for water systems. And risks are recognized very often. But anybody who's in business or not, I guess, recognizes that wherever there is a risk, someone else has an opportunity. And that's the framing of that particular piece. And the risks that we are talking about usually are the risks related to climate, the risks related to financial wherewithal, the risks related to aging infrastructure, and the risks related to increasing demands. So we have to find a way by which we can take those risks and turn them into opportunities. So that's what the program is about. You may have noticed that there are zero people on the panels from Colombia, and that's by design. Uh, we want to foster this conversation. We want to build the partnerships with the people that we have invited here, panelists as well as others. So we will listen, and we will absorb, and we will try to continue this conversation to the benefit of all as much as we can. Thank you. With that, I would like to invite our keynote speaker, Gretchen McLean, who is the CEO of Xylem, that was previously ITT. Uh, my connection with her geographically goes back to when I was at the University of Utah, and so was she. But we didn't know each other then precisely. Uh, Gretchen is an amazing, innovative, dynamic leader. It's the kind of leader that takes a large company and turns it into a startup with the value behind it at the same time. So with that, let me introduce Gretchen. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Manu. Um, it is really a great opportunity to be here and to be part of today. This is really an important conversation that we need to continue to have, and we need to do our part to continue to educate um, the general public about the situation that we face. But before, I'd like to get, before I get started, I wanted to thank the Columbia University. I'd like to thank the, the Earth Institute, the Columbia Water Center, in particular, um, Manu, for your leadership, for demonstrating um, the importance of this and making this dialogue and this discussion happen. It's not easy to pull a team of people together and it is an important dialogue that we need to continue to talk about and not just talk about but to find solutions and highlight those solutions so that action can be taken. So again I'm really pleased to be here to be part of the dialogue to learn um, because that knowledge is helpful for us as we run a company in the water industry to say what more can we do and how do we change our thinking to be able to help solve the issues that we all face. Years ago, you know, we used to speak about water security and scarcity and when we used to talk about that, we would talk about places like Africa. We'd talk about India and certain places in Australia we'd hear about. But not anymore. Today, we don't only talk about those areas, but we talk about Texas. We talk about Georgia, we talk about California, and we're also talking about 33 additional American states that in the very short period of time will be faced with acute water shortage. So the, the dynamics has changed. And when we talk about water security, it's not about rainfall. Having access to water means protecting the water that we have. And that requires sacrifice, and it means all of us are gonna need to take some actions and address it. And the fact of the matter is that too many Americans, and I can tell you I have in the past and I still do too often, take for granted the access that we have of clean and safe water for granted. We all do it. And we need to continue to be responsible, educating and ensuring people understand that. We've got to be the ones that lead the way. The nation's water infrastructure, the pipes, the systems that transport and treat our water is severely at risk, as you all know. We lose 1.7 trillion gall gallons each year, and each year that costs us nearly $3 billion. And if that's not bad enough, some studies show that blocked or leaking pipes release 10 billion gallons of raw sewage into our waterways. And a few years ago, from the New York Times, they reported that since 2004, 62 million Americans have been exposed to unsafe water. So here in New York, We've been lucky enough to have a government that is, and in many ways, at the vanguard of the investments of our infrastructure. For example, New York has invested $6 billion to construct the 60-mile-long water tunnel, the largest capital construction in the city's history. So they're investing in changing the situation. This will ensure that future generations of New Yorkers will have clean, reliable supply of drinking water. 
so essential to the importance of the health of the people here, but even more important to the economic growth of New York. And still, as we saw just this last fall, the super, the super storm Sandy made it clear that our city's infrastructure absolutely needs to be modernized. You know, the storm water that we saw during that time overwhelmed the, the sewer systems that closed the subways for not just days, but for weeks. And it really brought the city down to a standstill. And I know many of you felt it, were part of it, probably lived through it, had, if not yourselves, friends. It was difficult around here to get around and to get business up and running and moving again. So as Mayor Bloomberg has said, despite the significant investments that they've already made here in New York, it's not enough. The city needs at least $28 billion over the next 20 years to modernize the drinking water and the sewage systems. It's a large amount of money. And that question not only comes as where do we find the money, but also can we summon the political will to make this happen. The rest of America also faces significant issues that should worry all of us. Many of you know that in many cities, they're still using 100 plus year old pipes, many of them made of wood. And most of our treatment systems, they're not set up today to cope with the modern contaminants that we all see, the pharmaceutical pollutants, pollutants that we all um, understand are out there. And they're not coping with it when we know technology exists today that can be implemented to resolve these issues. So it's abundantly clear in my mind, and I know in all of yours, that addressing our water security requires us to strengthen the fundamental of the water system. And as Manu said, how do we rethink this as we go forward? Not just fix, but we fix it with a sustainable solution. And this goes from flood control to treatment systems to wastewater discharge. So what is the fix? At Xylem, we believe that the best way to build a modernized effective water and wastewater model and network is to create a sustainable business model for our nation's water utilities. By definition, such a business model must be predicated on the fair price valuation, paying for water, what water costs. If we can make this happen, the first step must be first to really educate people, to help people understand the urgent need to invest and the potential effects that if we don't do anything, it will cost a significant amount more than actually taking the actions that we need to do today to fix the problem that we face. Americans should understand that the price of water must better reflect the value of water. And that in fact, that protecting our water requires commitment. Not just our government, but all of us need to play a part in fixing the issue. And we also know that when we make the efforts to educate the Americans, they're willing to do their part. Three years ago, Xylem launched what we called our first value of water index. It was a, na a nationwide poll of Americans where we asked them what should be done in the country's infrastructure and who should pay to fix it. The most important thing we found out was the vast majority of Americans are worried about the state of the U.S. water infrastructure and are willing to pay more to fix it. Last year we ran a second survey to the index to see if uh, the perception has changed over the last couple years. And as it turns out, two years, ago, two years later, Americans are willing to actually pay more. In 2012, the respondents said that they're willing to pay an average of $7.70 more a month, which is up $1.50 from where they were two years ago. And so why is that important? Let me just put that in perspective. If we took the public up on that notion that they'd pay $7.70 more each month, that would increase our investment of to $6.4 billion more each year. And that's six times the current federal support that we get in our drinking water system. And we also looked at New Yorkers. We said, New Yorkers, what do you think? How do you feel about this? They actually feel even stronger than the Americans about the need to fix our water infrastructure. Almost every New Yorker surveyed are, is concerned about the state of the water infrastructure. And this was before Superstorm Sandy. In fact, 70% of our water infrastructure needs major repair or a complete overhaul. 82% of the New Yorkers believe the water and the wastewater infrastructure should be a top priority of the city. 
And even more said that was more important than fixing the subways. That's an important vote. Almost two-thirds of the city residents are willing to pay an average of about $8 more per month to finance water infrastructure upgrades. And about three-quarters of those surveys think that policymakers need to take action to address this issue. So the Americans and New Yorkers agree that we need to fix our water systems and that both of us and both of them are willing to take their own actions, but they also clearly told us that there's a responsibility at all levels of the government and it also needs to be addressed at the local level. So that's great news. A willingness to act is an important first step, but it's just the first step. So first and foremost, I think we need to take action, as I've said. And in this case, I think it, it really means that we need to find more leaders who are willing to take that political will, stand up, because I think that's the bigger issue. Technology is out there, and we can find creative ways to find money by public relationships, public and private relationships. You know, when you look at the cost to maintain systems today, you can bring that cost down to invest in other areas. It's the political will to take action. Many politicians, Mayor Bloomberg in New York, Mayor Emanuel in Chicago, you've got Governor Perry in Texas, they've shown considerable forethought in taking actions to make their water systems upgraded, putting investment behind it because they recognize the importance of their economic growth. And so action is being taken around the globe. But we're still a long, long way to actually upgrading our systems and making them sound and making them in a well-positioned um, situation to be able to get that economic growth that we want to have so much here in America. For those of us in the industry, solving the water issue is a tremendous opportunity. It's also a tremendous responsibility. And we have an important role to play. So second, I believe that our industry must come together with one voice. We need to be able to energize all parties involved. That's the government, it's private sector, it's academia, it's citizens. And let's talk about the issues and talk about the successes and how we can move this forward. But in order to do this, I believe we must first reach consens consensus about the status of the water as a unifying industry. And I think we need to start here, right here in the US. A fragmented industry, in my mind, cannot expect to create change with a fragmented point of view. The water sector needs to come to the same page. We need to join forces. And we need to continue to report out on the initial stages of what we can do to build a, co a, to build a coalition. And I am happy to tell you, I have been working with uh, many of my peers in the water industry, many of them sitting here, and we are working very hard to come together as a team with associations with a common point of view to help address this issue and get the spotlight on the water industry that it so very much needs. And that leads to the third point, which is education is key. And the water industry must do its part in terms of you know, raising public awareness and engagement and talking about the situation. We can build consensus and we can do that in a way that it can drive both a national and global priority around water. I think it's also important that we show and we talk about what the infrastructure of the future can look like. A smart infrastructure, one that's more reliable, one that is more energy efficient and more capable of alerting us of issues ahead of time, ultimately with real-time information and, and measurement and information and less expensive to operate and to maintain. Today, we're in a break and fix mode. We need to develop to where we are proactive, predicting, maintenance, and that technology and those services and those, the software is all out there. It's a matter of us integrating it together and moving forward and using that data to help us reduce the costs and get innovation back in. And very importantly, it also helps us create jobs. According to the Water um, Federation, Environmental Federation, every, every uh, $1 billion invested in the water infrastructure can create 28,000 28, jobs. We're all faced with you know, putting people back to work. We need good technology and good jobs. Putting investment in our water infrastructure that's so important to us can put a lot of good people back to work. And greater awareness ultimately can lead to support of increased investment, but even more importantly, it spurs the innovation that Manu talked about. Innovation in this industry is critical 
because it's going to allow us to develop more efficient, more cost-effective, and sustainable solutions for the future. And innovation, as we all know, brings on competition. And when you've got competition, it brings the cost down. And so again, the focus and the attention on industry is critically important to bring that innovation. Think of many of the engineers coming out of colleges today. They're not thinking about coming into the water industry. And we need technology and innovation into this industry more than ever. It's a great opportunity to make a change, not only for today, but for the future and for the generations to come. And I'd love to be able to demonstrate this industry is ready for change, and I think you'll see young engineers moving into this industry. So as leaders and innovators in the water industry, we have an important responsibility, and that is to show the world the value of water. And not only that, not only that but also the value of preserving and protecting our water, not for just today, but for the many generations behind us. Preserving that security of our water supply requires, a, requires all of us to do actions now. And, and we must start it together. So I'd just like to end with, I hope you will join us. Xylem has a uh, phrase, and it's used both for an internal perspective as well as an external perspective, which is, let's as a company come together, because we've got enormous amount of expertise having worked in the water industry for so many years in different applications. So it's not just a rally call for us internal, the company, but also externally. Let's solve water, because not any one of us can do it alone. So thank you, and I, hope, uh, I look forward to the dialogue today. I hope to learn a lot, and hopefully we can continue to help. I, I would like to go ahead and start with our panels. The first panel is on the total management of the urban water cycle, and the moderator for the panel is David Nahai, uh, who I've gotten to know over the last couple of years. He's wonderful. Uh, he's a lawyer by training. He headed the Los Angeles Water and Power, so he actually developed an appreciation for it. And since then, he's been working with the Clinton Global Initiative. So there's a lot of do-gooding that's going on here. Well, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you and to uh, act as the moderator for this panel of uh, very distinguished uh, uh, panelists. So I'm going to call them up uh, to the dais. Um, I'm then going to just spend a few minutes to try to provide some context to what we're going to be talking about. They will then take five minutes each to make presentations, and then we'll go to Q&A. And when we do that, um, could you please write your questions out on the note cards that are on the table? And I think that'll make for a much smoother uh, discussion when we get to it. Um, our subject is managing the total urban water cycle. That means everything from water supply all the way to wastewater treatment and disposal uh, and or reuse. So this is a, a vast subject and we're going to try to do it all in 50 minutes. And we're going to talk not just about the United States but about the rest of the world as well and try to draw lessons uh, from different places. Um, uh, you, you know, we talk about the global water crisis and I think it's legitimate and necessary that we do that. I think it's necessary that we draw attention to the fact that there are one and a half million children under the age of five that die every year from water-related diseases, that nearly a billion people don't have access to clean drinking water, that 2.6 don't have access to adequate sanitation, that we're on this inexorable collision course between uh, an explosion in population growth and climate change, which will constrain water resources around the world. But while we do that, we also have to acknowledge that the solutions are necessarily local, because there's such variability around the world. Even here in the United States, we see that in New York, the water comes from the Catskills. Uh, in San Francisco, it comes from the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, uh, which uh, gets water from snowmelt. Denver is dependent on snowmelt. South Florida is dependent on the Biscayne uh, groundwater basin. Uh, a number of Southern California uh, areas are also dependent on, on groundwater. Los Angeles gets 90% of its water from hundreds of miles outside the city. Um, and so there, there, there are different challenges because there are different resources to be dealt with and they have to be looked at locally. But there are five issues that kind of bedevil all of us in varying degrees, right? And there are, of course, infrastructure and the deterioration in our infrastructure, uh, which is now, I think, uh, at a crisis point. There are ever escalating environmental regulations that utilities have to deal with. Uh, there are needs, there's a need for new water resources, especially in the southwest uh, of our country. 
uh, there are the, un the uncertainties of climate change. What is that going to do to us? Will we enter boom and bust uh, cycles, you know, drought and deluge cycles? And finally, of course, there's the issue of where all the money is going to come from. I can tell you that for us in LA, we know that getting 90% of our water from outside the city is no longer sustainable. And it's no longer sustainable because a lot of that water is dependent on the eastern Sierra snowpack, which is increasingly showing itself to be not terribly dependent. So we've got to move to more conservation, to infrastructure repair, uh, green buildings, wastewater recycling, rainfall capture, aquifer remediation, storage, uh, underground storage in, in particular. And, and while we do all of that, we have to decide what investments are going to be wise so that we don't end up with white elephants in times of plenty, and where's the money going to come from? And when we remember, and I'll finish with this, that 90% of Americans who get their water get it from a governmental entity, 97% are dependent on the government for wastewater services, that means that we're in a whole new area as far as where the finances are going to come from. And that means that we have to start now to take a look very seriously in the US at private public uh, partnerships because we really haven't done that in a meaningful way here and we have to do that while continuing to respect the fact that for Americans by and large water is a public asset and so I'll stop there and let me um, welcome up our first speaker who's Bill Becker. Uh, Bill is vice president excuse me he is the Vice President and the Drinking Water Practice Leader at Hazen and Sawyer. He holds a PhD in Environmental Engineering from John Hopkins, a BS and MS degrees from Clarkson University. Bill has more than 25 years experience and is currently an adjunct professor at Columbia University. Please welcome. Thank you, David. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I, um, I've had the good fortune in my career to spend the last uh, 10 or 12 years working on the New York City water system, which um, I'm sure Dave Warren will touch on in more detail later, but it's, it's truly one of the most fascinating water supplies in the world. Uh, more recently, for the last year or two, I've been spending a lot of time in Southern California, which is, is equally, if not more, fascinating water pictures out there. Um, I suspect you'll hear a lot today about the, the pressures on water supply. I'd like to focus my comments a little bit more on water quality issues. Um, of course, the two are, are highly interrelated. We can start by looking at the impact that diminishing supplies has on water utilities. Uh, several utilities in different parts of the country have been forced to use poor quality source waters for different reasons. Even here in New York, where we have plentiful water, um, there's aging infrastructure issues. And one of them is the Delaware Aqueduct is leaking uh, about 30 million gallons of water a day. That needs to be fixed. Uh, the length of duration that it'll take to fix it is unknown. That one pipe brings 50% of the water into the city. Um, so during the fix, the city needs to find other sources of water and it's not the pristine Catskill water that will be coming into the city during, during that part of time. Um, so these, these are causing utilities around the country to look at, at poor quality source waters. Um, California, they're looking at the Central Valley, which is highly contaminated groundwater. Uh, Chrome 6 is everywhere. There's a lot of pollutants from uh, all sorts of industries out there, but that's the next big project for LA and other cities in the Central Valley that's out there. Um, here in New Jersey, Queens, um, it's common to use contaminated aquifers for drinking water sources. Um, you move on and start looking at the, the number of uh, extreme weather events. Um, for those that were, you, were here this morning, you saw a plot of the exponential increase in extreme weather events that has occurred over the last uh, few decades. And of course, storms like uh, Hurricane Sandy, uh, huge droughts are having uh, um, big impacts on water quality. And those, those impacts can affect um, the way treatment plants perform often causing them to shut down or reduce output um, due to elevated solids loading. Uh, during droughts, contaminants get concentrated into water reservoirs and rivers. Those then get flushed in with excess nutrients to treatment systems and it causes treatment uh, problems at the plant. Uh, likewise, there's been a large number of increase of forest fires, particularly out west. 
um, those fires are becoming more widespread and have long-term implications on water quality at many utilities out there. Um, there's some pictures. This shows the uh, New York City Shokin Reservoir after a huge rainfall event. You can see the top portion of that is where the water comes into the reservoir. Um, high turbidity levels, and you can just see that turbidity creeping over into the other side. Um, you know, New York's an unfiltered supply, so they have to take extreme measures to move water around to protect that water from getting into the, into the system. Um, droughts, forest fires are shown there. Um, climate change is causing long-term degradation for a lot of reservoirs. You know, the most sensitive water bodies are starting to show up now. Um, it causes elevated levels of natural organic matter or changes in the character of organic matter. We now have more advanced techniques like 3D fluorescence that we can use to look at these changes in organic matter. And, and they're the subtle changes that utilities don't often pick up on, but end up having a large impact on treatability of water. Natural organic matter produces disinfection byproducts, it fouls membranes, it causes the use of granular activated carbon. Um, so these long-term changes are really causing treatment changes on a widespread basis. Here in the Northeast, we're very fortunate. We have great water supplies in general. We have unfiltered supplies in Boston, New York, Syracuse. A lot of utilities just have direct filtration plants. Um, some have conventional treatment plants, but when you start moving down the coast more and you get into the Virginias, the Carolinas, Florida, that's where you see advanced treatment processes being commonplace. Ozonation, uh, membranes, granular activated carbon, all very expensive treatment processes that fortunately we haven't had a really invest a lot of money in up in this part of the world yet, but it could be coming. Um, and this kind of brings us to this, um, some people call it the water energy nexus. I like to refer to it as the water resources and water quality solution cycle. And it kind of goes like this. Um, you start here with the water quality change and what do we do? Well, as engineers and utility directors, we like to throw technology at things. So we put in, uh, membrane treatment, we put in ozonation, we put in GAC. These are all very energy intensive uh, processes that feeds into the cycle of increasing climate change and extreme weather events and now we have even more water quality changes that we have to deal with. And so we need innovations to break this cycle and that's where you know the students, it was mentioned earlier, that's where the students in this room come in. I think um, it's their challenge as well as ours to, to develop these solutions. And one that you'll hear a lot more about is the recycling or reuse of wastewater. Um, this part of the world, it's not so common, although there are buildings down in southern Manhattan. There's about a half a dozen buildings now that have water reuse systems right in them. It's amazing if you ever get a chance, go down and take a tour, but they collect the wastewater in a basement. They treat it through membrane bioreactors and ozonation, and it goes back up into very expensive apartments, I might add, and it's used for um, toilet flushing water, uh, rooftop gardens, cooling, et cetera. But you go out west where the water challenges are greater and you see there's utilities like West Basin that treats 30 to 40 million gallons of water a day of wastewater, turns it back into drinking water, puts it into the ground, and there's an environmental buffer and withdraws it a, a few months later for drinking purposes. The latest initiative is a direct potable reuse um, initiative that Southern California is starting. Um, they've raised millions of dollars from manufacturers and consulting firms and utilities to actually take wastewater, treat it, and put it right into the pipe to the distribution system. And I think, you know, there's a lot of issues about that. That's why this initiative has raised in millions of dollars to support that in the future. But you'll hear a lot more of that in the future. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, if, if we have time, I'd like to explore the direct portable reuse uh, options that are being looked at a little bit more because they, they are so... Uh, problematic as far as people's psychological readiness for them is concerned. Um, our, next, uh, uh, our next speaker is Mohamed uh, Hariri Pode. Uh, he is uh, the Corporate Sustainability Manager at Frito-Lay North America, a division of PepsiCo. And in his honor, I had a glass of Pepsi before coming up here. Uh, he received his uh, doctoral degree in environment. Did you actually insist that they serve Pepsi rather than Coca-Cola? No? No. <laughs> Um, he received his doctoral degree in environmental engineering, specializing in water and wastewater from Tulane University. He has more than 26 years of experience in water and wastewater treatment, water quality management, and environmental compliance management systems, and has published more than 60 journals, papers, and conference papers at the national and international levels. Thank you. 
Thanks, Dave. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today and talk to you about the role of industry in solution to the global water crisis. So I have uh, five minutes, so we not only have water crisis, we have time crisis too. So I have to finish my presentation in five minutes. I will try to do my best. So uh, everyone knows the water shortage is a national and international problem. It's a growing national and international problem that is demanding a practical solution. Again, I emphasize practical solution in order to protect present and future generations and help to minimize the health, environmental, and economy risks, including water security issues. Amount of water the industry are using is about 22% of the available fresh water, but this is just the water which is used inside the process. If we look at the water which is used upstream and downstream, which adding the supply chain, it has a big impact and actually makes the scenario worse. Uh, they use about 70 to 90% of the fresh water. But at least the good news is the water is a renewable resource. We can use it, treat it, and use it. Now, the stakeholder in industrialized country have clearly mentioned that global water shortage is a major concern and solving this problem requires help from industries. So what is the solution to the global water crisis? Is water sustainability. But in order to achieve water sustainability, we need to have collaboration. So collaboration is vital in achieving the water sustainability. And of course, industry can play a key role in achieving the water sustainability. What the industry should do, they should develop their water management strategies. And their strategies should, as, should account all aspects of water. They need, look, they need to look at inside the manufacturing plants, inside the supply chain, and outside. So they need to have internal strategies and external strategies. On the internal strategies, they need to develop their water conservation goals or practices and implement it. They need to do, basically, uh, identify their water metrics. They need to identify their goals and targets. They need to do annual water audits to identify the water opportunities and where there is a cost saving. They need to do training they need to do capacity buildings. These are the key component of the water management strategies on the internal side. On the external side, they need to work with the outside agency, communities, watersheds. They need to determine the availability of the water in the community. They need to develop a, a strategic partnership based on mutual beneficial outcomes. So those are the things that they need to do. But what is the solution to the global water crisis? We know water conservation, we know it's gonna help a lot. We know fixing rate is gonna, uh, raising rate is gonna help. We know increasing wastewater treatment costs is gonna help. Um, imposing more regulation on the wastewater discharge limits on the MPDS permits is gonna help. Fixing leaks, leaks, all those things are gonna help. But it's not gonna be a solution when we're looking at reducing our water by 50, 70, 80% reduction. The most promising solution to global water crisis is water recovery and reuse. And PepsiCo, as part of its uh, robust and thoughtful approach to sustainability uh, targets, especially water sustainability targets and environmental sustainability, uh, selected one of its manufacturing plants a few years ago to be the first water, full-scale water recovery and reuse plant. And this plant is a food manufacturing plant in Casa Grande, Arizona. Now we develop a solution, or solution started from developing the concept, prove it at the bench scale, moving to the pilot scale, and then now as we speak today, we have proved it at the full scale. That was a long journey for us to identify the challenges, to resolve the issues, but today we have a plant that we can recover our water by 75%. 75% of water recovery, which translates to saving more than 100 million gallons of water. And the Technology that we use is all a combination of advanced water treatment technology which allow us to convert or process water to drinking water quality. The water that meets the EPA primary and secondary drinking water standards, water that exceeds the city water quality. I have a table here and there is not that much time to spend on it. I just touched 
on few key parameters, and then I will finish my five minutes. If you look at it, by treating the water or recycling and recovering water, we're going to get a better water. And if you look at the city water in the city of Arizona, or Casa Grande in Arizona, we have lots of, you know, contaminant in the water. It is below EPA limit. It meets the EPA criteria. There is no issue. But in the city of Casa Grande, for example, we have nitrate. In our recovered water, we have no nitrate. In arsenic, it exists in city water, right? It's below EPA limit. It's fine. There is no issue with it. But our recovered water has no arsenic, lead. Our recovered water has no lead. So we are not only generating a water supply on site, we are not only protecting the environment, we are also producing a water with a better quality and also be reducing our water footprint. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, I, I left my, uh, my post as head of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power about three years ago, and I came back to the private sector and formed my consulting company and joined the law firm. And then, and then one day, I, I got a call uh, to join the advisory board of a company that was then ITT, which the water's part of it uh, spun off and became silent. And, uh, and, and, and that was a call that I remember with such fondness because it brought me into contact uh, with someone who I consider to be not just one of the great water leaders in the United States of America and worldwide, but, but one of the great CEOs uh, with, uh, with, who personifies the kinds of values uh, and ambitions that, uh, that CEOs should uh, uh, personify. And that's Gretchen McLean, and I want to invite her up to the podium. Uh, Gretchen is the CEO of, uh, of Xylem. Uh, Xylem helps customers solve water challenges in more than 150 countries with 12,700 employees and generates annual revenues of $3.8 billion. Well, I'm humbled with that introduction. Um, let me just, uh, I want to make a couple of points on this because I already got a chance to talk and I think you understand you know, where my heart, my belief is in terms of the water industry and what we truly can do to, to address this issue. But it does take action. It means all of us as leaders need to step up. But I show this chart for a couple of reasons. We need to think of the water industry as the full wa water cycle. You can't just think about the water distribution. We can't just think about it in terms of, you know, water users. We've got to think about that return of that dirty water, how we treat it, how we protect it, and ultimately how we can use innovation, and many people have already mentioned this, how we can reuse that water in a different way because the technology is there. But it means all of us have to think about systems. We have to think about an engineering solution, not just a point solution. We've got to get out of the fragmentation that at one point in time was very important to the U.S. as we were growing fast and we needed to develop. We needed to make sure that we, weren't addressing, we were addressing each of the issues as we were in a rapid growth environment. Today we're not in that same situation. We need to pull back. We need to move some of that um, infrastructure that's in our way and get it out of our way as a barrier so that we can make progress. I mentioned before, technology exists. That doesn't mean we don't need more technologies. We do. We as industry need to continue to invest. We need to continue to work with the universities to be able to challenge our mind, take new R&D and apply that into applications and technology that can be applicable and put into an infrastructure and probably a different infrastructure. But we've got to think differently and we've got to be willing to take some risk. We have been an industry that has slowly moved because we've been able to continue to grow in a growing environment. So it now means pulling back, taking some risk, trying some things, which means where we see key examples in cities or key examples in communities where they've had success, making sure we're sharing that information so other leaders have the confidence and the courage to stand up in front of their communities to be able to say there is solutions and here's some of those solutions. If we do this, this is what we're going to get in return. And so sharing, collaboration, innovation, a little bit of risk, getting away from our risk aversion is going to be important to change this community and this um, water industry the way it needs to be. I'm very hopeful. I'm confident we can do it. And I think, you know, our play, our business, Xylem, we've been in the water industry for 150 years. We serve 160 countries. We have worked with many, many customers. We have an enormous expertise and applications expertise that we can put to bear. But we also 
are blinded and limited in terms of what we can do, but if we join arms with others, I can guarantee you we can have a better you know, society, we can have a better um, future of our water, and we can continue to see the growth we've seen in the past. Thank you, Gretchen. Our next speaker is Rod Naylor. Uh, he has worked in the water industry in Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom and the United States for 25 years in both public utilities and the private sector, most recently delivering major projects in desalination and, and water recycling. He was an executive director of Veolia, Veolia Water's operations and subsidiaries and a part of the Veolia Water Asia Pacific Management Committee. He recently began directing the Department of Environmental Protection's operational excellence contract. You like these long things for them. Um, a new model for public-private partnerships focused on delivering performance and cost improvement within public utilities. Rod Naylor. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, David, and thank you to the, the Earth Institute and to everyone else here for the opportunity to, uh, to start to contribute. Um, I've only been in, in the US uh, three months myself. I've just arrived. So uh, I'm, I'm welcomed by this sort of thing regularly, Gretchen, if you wouldn't mind to make me feel at home. <laughs> I don't know who here has the sense of humour, but you're saving me making a joke. Well done. <laughs> Down under. Um, of droughts and flooding rains. Uh, because I've not been here long, I think the best way I can contribute, perhaps, is, uh, is to share some stories of our experience in Australia, because it's, it's through listening to our stories uh, that we can learn. And uh, everything I've heard in the last uh, half an hour or 40 minutes, I think, rings very true with our history in Australia. Uh, those words, though, are from the, from the poet Dorothea McKellar and penned um, uh, early last century when she described my country, uh, as I feel it is, uh, as a sunburnt country and, and as a wide brown land, as a land of droughts and flooding rains. And, and boy, hasn't that come true. Um, as Americans, many of you probably have a, an image of, of Australians through Crocodile Dundee, shrimp on the barbie, this sort of fun. Um, <laughs> But in actual fact, Australia is, uh, I'm not sure if we still have the title, but the, the most urbanised uh, nation on the planet, uh, something you don't expect. But that's exactly because our, our nation is so water stressed in many areas that we all live uh, on the very fringe where there's, where there's adequate water supplies. So just to try and put things into context, I guess in Australia, uh, we're less water stressed than the US, according to Growing Blue. Uh, we price water higher than the US. We also extract more value per capita per day and we use not quite half, but more, a bit under half as much per person. But we hit water stress in Australia and in a big time. Um, after years of trying to control through monopolies, water scarcity through restrictions, through limiting the availability of water, Australia had a wake up last, uh, last decade when we hit the crisis of an absolute drought. Um, in a few moments I'm going to try and, uh, and I guess articulate to you how three different cities responded to that because in it I think is a, is a dramatic lesson about how there is the possibility for change when there is an imperative. Um, the first of those cities to hit, uh, to hit restrictions was Brisbane who used to having full dams fell to nearly 17% or just over a year's storage and the threat to a major economy um, through water scarcity suddenly became real for Australians. Brisbane responded with a very large investment program of $9 billion to build centralised recycling and seawater desalination plants uh, in order to respond. Um, Melbourne also faced, uh, also on the east coast of Australia, huge uh, issues in terms of water scarcity, falling to 25% of storage. Again, absolutely unprecedented. I should mention that what happened during this seven or eight year drought was that the statistics which underpinned our confidence in our resources, in our water resources, was absolutely broken. When these few years of data were brought into the calculations, suddenly the water we thought we had just wasn't there and the crisis became real. Melbourne also responded by building a desalination plant. Um, and also by building transport networks to bring water across the country from different catchments. Spending, uh, well, not spending, but bringing private investment in and private delivery to deliver a three and a half billion dollar treatment plant and a billion dollar pipeline. Sydney then, where I'm from, also responded. Uh, we, had, we reduced our storage to 32%, spending a billion dollars on a desalination plant and another billion on a pipeline to connect. Um, interestingly, Sydney chose a separate model Brisbane went with private sector delivery because of the speed, because of the new technologies we needed to adopt, but through an alliance contract. Sydney chose a design, build and operate contract, but then later on sold a 50-year lease and brought private finance in 
to leverage the debt, to recycle debt on the government's balance sheet and therefore enable further infrastructure investment. And in doing so, in de-risking the project, actually earned $300 million premium on the sale. What Sydney's also done, though, is instead of a centralised recycling plant, Sydney moved to uh, a, a distributed system of several small plants. Melbourne, on the other hand, has moved to a planning regime uh, described by the group uh, Living Victoria through the Open Living Victoria plan, which I think from the three re represents the best response in the longer term. Uh, in Melbourne, we've moved from a plan of, of recycling uh, in a large scale to what was described earlier exactly as distributed networks, distributed systems. I guess I'd put to you that the experience in Australia, the fright that we got uh, from the reality of water scarcity, from the real possibility of, of major cities running out of water, putting their economies, putting their populations at risk, was an appreciation that a restriction model didn't work and that we need to bring integration, uh, we need to bring water efficiency, not restrictions, and we need to free up the availability of water in a water scarce nation to be able to support our economy, to be able to support an Australiable, a sustainable Australia. Thank you. Our final uh, speaker, last but by no means least, is David Warren, who has been with the New York City Department of Environmental Protection since 1993 and is the Assistant Commissioner for Watershed Protection Programs for New York City. He oversees all regulatory and partnership components of the city's comprehensive source water protection program. Additionally, he coordinates with communities in upstate New York that take water from the New York City system. He attended Wesleyan University and has a master's in public and private management from Yale. Um, thank you very much, Dave. Very glad to be here. Um, I hope everybody's had a glass of water um, from the tap today. Uh, it's clean, it's delicious, and at a penny a gallon, I'm not sure it's fair, fairly priced, but it's cheap. Um, so I wanted to just talk briefly. I think uh, the New York City water supply represents a really great case study for many of the themes that we've been talking about already today. Also, as the sort of token public sector representative on the panel, I did want to um, provide some perspective on that um, aspect of addressing many of these challenges. Um, I had um, wanted to focus here on kind of balancing both the quantity and the quality uh, demands on the water supply system in what I termed an evolving climate. And I don't by that just mean climate change. I mean the um, financial climate that we're working in, the regulatory climate. Um, and trying to blend all the considerations that um, we've heard discussed today into um, uh, an example of how we're moving ahead here in the city uh, with projects and programs that I think can be um, examples for other, other cities. Um, we're dealing, uh, we're very fortunate to have a very um, robust supply um, but we do deal with real demand pressures uh, because the, there's demand on the city supply not just from the 8 million people in the city and the million people north of the city who drink the water, um, but also from uh, the streams downstream of our reservoirs where our releases maintain fisheries and maintain ecological health. Um, there's demand on us to manage our water supply system for um, flood, uh, flood control, flood resiliency, which in many ways is completely counter to how you would manage a water supply from simply a supply perspective. Um, and upstate, we were not particularly hard hit by Hurricane Sandy, um, but a year before, Hurricane Irene was a very devastating event uh, in, in the watershed, and it brought into focus um, a lot of the issues in terms of flood management, flood resiliency for watershed communities and us as a water supplier. Um, Bill mentioned the condition of infrastructure a little bit within the New York City supply. We do know that we have a leak within the uh, Rondout West Branch Tunnel, which delivers half of our water on an average basis. We're working on and have actually broken ground on a project to build a bypass around the leaking section so that we can repair that infrastructure. That's a multi-billion dollar project that will uh, take more than a decade to complete. Um, we're dealing uh, with emerging conditions. We are dealing with ch climate change, uh, which we think there's a real trend in uh, increasing uh, high flow events, which create turbidity issues for our water supply. Um, we also have issues with uh, organic carbon uh, delivering into the water, and Bill mentioned uh, uh, disinfectant byproduct compliance. Um, but at the same time, we're also concerned about drought. Frankly, to me, drought is more of a concern for us. Um, 
we demonstrated in uh, Hurricane Irene that because of the flexibility of our system, we have 19 reservoirs in our system, that we can move water around when we have lots of it and we have um, isolated quality problems. When you don't have any water, you don't have anything to move around, and that becomes a much bigger challenge for us. And we have seen uh, drought conditions as recently as the last, last decade. The regulatory climate for us um, is a real driver. Um, in part, um, that has been driven by, I think, increasing analytical capability and the ability to detect more compounds at lower levels. Um, in some cases, it's not known whether those compounds represent public health concerns or not. But nonetheless, there's a pressure to, to lower the standards and, and to provide more regulation. Um, and often what we see in the regulatory structure is there's not the prioritized benefit cost analysis um, work done um, to ensure that the kind of projects that we're being forced to implement are really the best way to spend our money. We spend a considerable amount of effort uh, trying to convince uh, federal regulators that we do not need to cover our finished water reservoir, Hillview Reservoir, um, because we have um, a system of additional protections in place to protect, protect against contamination in that reservoir, and building a 90-acre concrete cover at cost of billions of dollars simply doesn't make sense. It's not good public investment. Um, the last thing I just want to mention is, is kind of the public sector perspective here. Um, I do work for New York City government. Um, this may come as a surprise. Civil servants are not highly regarded. Um, we are, at best, lazy and incompetent. At worst, we're corrupt and venal. And it's, it's, it's very hard for us to speak with a lot of credibility, or at least to be heard with a lot of credibility, by water consumers, um, by the public in general, by the regulators, by the uh, non-governmental organizations and the environmental community that's so interested in water issues. Um, and be heard, and we are also not particularly nimble. Um, city government was not set up to be um, flexible and creative. And so we've had to develop workarounds in our watershed program uh, to work with partners where they have our, uh, more flexibility than we do in terms of contracting, in terms of programming development, in terms of partnerships, um, so that we've had to work around many of the city policies and processes that were set up um, you know, when our department was organized. And so that's a real factor uh, as we move forward and try and figure out um, our best strategies for protecting the water supply. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask you each a question arising out of, out of some of the things that you said. And, and please try to restrict your answers to about a minute or so. Um, hope, and I'm hoping that this will uh, also stimulate some discussion from the audience as well. So let's start with you, Bill. And, uh, it, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, direct potable use. I, I know that we have the technology to do that. And we know that, for instance, places like Israel already recycle 80% of their wastewater. In LA, apart from West Basin that you mentioned, we're probably about 1% or 2% right now. So, so, I mean, that's a real sin. We have to do that. Um, and, I, and I think people have already ex accepted indirect potable use, in which you allow the highly treated wastewater to percolate through the soil for additional natural cleansing, etc. Do you think that people in Southern California or elsewhere in the United States are ready for direct potable use? Do you think we've done an adequate job of education and explanation for that to be an option at this point? Um, no, I, I don't think today they're ready. I don't think as an engineer today I'm ready. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, I think there's a considerable amount of research that needs to be done to make sure that the systems we put in place are protective of public health. Um, there's a lot of things in wastewater we don't even measure. We don't know what's there yet. Um, so some more research needs to be done from that perspective. But you're right, there's indirect reuse um, all over the country. You know, by some estimates, water's been in and out of the human body seven times between the upper Mississippi and the time it gets to New Orleans. And, um, you know, there's a lot of places, there's some direct potable reuse places now. In Africa, Windhoek has a direct line from their wastewater plant right to the, the drinking water intake. So it's, it's there, it's coming. I think we need to do as an industry a much better job of educating the public about that and the safety. And I think in places like California, that will be one part of their water portfolio. So. Uh, thank you for that. Um, 
Uh, Mohammed, uh, you, you talked a lot about the work that, uh, that, that PepsiCo does to make sure that the quality of the water that it uses in its products is even superior to what EPA requirements are. Do you think that, that the private sector, the private industry, especially those involved really in the, in, in, in the, uh, with water as, as an asset, do enough in terms of, of educating the public about the true value of, of water, about some of the things that we've, we've been talking about? Or do you think that companies such as yours, you know, take this asset, process it, make sure that it's of a higher quality, as you mentioned, and purely sell it? In other words, is there more, do you think, that the private sector could do in terms of educating the public about water issues? I think as we talked uh, earlier about the solution to the global water crisis is water sustainability, and part of that goes back to collaboration is vital. So all the industries need to take the responsibility and do whatever they can do in order to uh, uh, you know, conserve the water or reduce the water footprint. Uh, in case of industry, I think, you know, I just want to go back a little. That public perception which exists in case of sanitary wastewater does not exist here because we don't use sanitary wastewater. What we use is process water. So there is no sanitary wastewater. There is no wastewater from a traffic center. Everything goes to the POTW or city treatment plant. Mm -hmm. So we take our process water. Our process water is the water that we use just for washing. You know, our products is, is, is actually is not that bad. It's good. But we convert it to better than the city water that we were getting. Uh, as I, I, there was not enough time to explain this, but the point I was trying to uh, express here is that the recovered water could be much better than the original water even in case of, you know, city waters or mm -hmm. municipal waters. Uh, but, uh, of course, you know, I think or PepsiCo has done lots of things in the public and also in the, in the, within its employees. We have an army of, you know, water conservationists at our plants, all our manufacturing plants. Uh, they do, and as, public, as part of our community involvement, which, as I said, external strategies, or, or, or guys go to the school and they talk about what they have done. Mm -hmm. They talk about water conservation techniques at PepsiCo. They say what they have done. I mean, just part of the education, you know, the public. So I think, you know, uh, or, or PepsiCo has a very robust, uh, you know, water sustainability targets and goals. On both sides, they are working on the internal sides and external side. And this solution that PepsiCo developed, it took us a, it took us a time. It's easy to just talk about water recovery, but I want to mention this. There is challenges with water recovery, and we don't feel it until we get to it. We did a project which is, we expected to finish in two years. It lasts five years. Because you, one of the major challenges in water recovery is membrane fouling. It's not easy. There was not, this was not a technical discussion. And tomorrow, we're going to cover it at the Columbia University at the School of Engineering, some of the challenges and lessons learned. So water recovery can be done, you know, but there are some challenges ahead. But PepsiCo did this as a big experimental project. Right. We wanted to be proactive. We have a solution for global water crisis if we have to do. Um, there are places that we have already done this, like in Latin America, in Mexico, in um, Colombia, in Australia even, is taking place. There are places that water is an operational necessity. And there are places the water is expensive, and you can cost justify this type Thank of project. You. But the way that we look at the water rate and wastewater rate, I expect in the next few years, PepsiCo will have more plans like this. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. I have to say, I'm, I'm glad I won't be there tomorrow when the discussion about membrane fouling is going yeah. to take place. <laughs> yeah. um, no, thank you so much for that. Um, Gretchen, you, you talked about you know, forming coalitions and, and political uh, activity, and that's something that I think the water industry here has done so far precious little of. I mean, if we, if we consider that of the $787 billion that was really the stimulus package, less than 1% went to, went to water infrastructure, notwithstanding all of the jobs that it creates and the economic activity that it produces. So I, want, I wanted you to elaborate on that a little bit. How does the water industry get more involved politically? What coalitions do we need to, to form? How do we bring the enviros and the labor groups and others into the picture in order to you know, in, in, in order to really get the water message out there. Sure. Um, I'll give you my thoughts, and, and I don't have the perfect answer. I think we're all working to try that, to try and get that focus. Um, I'll give you some experience that I had from previous industry and then what I think we are doing today. I had worked in the space industry for a long time, and we worked on a program that 
ended up getting down to one vote of surviving with the Congress and with the administration and um, with the Senate. And it took the industry to come together and say, we're going to lose a very important program if we don't start working together. Yes, we're all going to potentially lose because we won't get the whole thing ourselves, but it required the industry to come together. And when that happened, it got the attention and the focus, and ultimately the industry moved on and was very successful. When I look at the water industry, and I mentioned earlier, it's very fragmented. You know, every water issue is very local in nature. And I'm not saying that we can forget about that because it is complex and, and that will never go away. But everyone in the water industry that is in some stage of the water cycle understands the aging infrastructure that we have, the energy inefficiency that we have within our infrastructure, um, the contaminations that are coming into their water, the demand of water is increasing and so forth. And I do believe if we can talk with one voice, we can get there. Today, the water industry has many different um, associations around different aspects of the water. And so they are very much talking, but they're talking about their specific issue. And I do think us coming together, we've never talked about jobs in the water industry as we are today, which we're all worried about putting people to work and also having good education and good jobs. Well, water technology and water industry requires a good engineering background. And to me, we bring that together, people can understand and paint the picture at a bigger level. I think it's, um, it's an opportunity for us. And so that's my passion and I think we can make it happen. Great, thank you very much. Um, Rod, when, when we wrote the water supply plan for the city of Los Angeles a number of years ago, uh, when I was at LADWP, we didn't include seawater desalination as one of, the, one of our priorities. Um, I felt very strongly and still do that we had all of these other things to do, from conservation to rainfall capture to wastewater recycling to aquifer remediation and so on. Uh, but, in, but in Australia, you know, just listening to your thought, Seawater desal was kind of, uh, you know, I don't want to say it was one of the first thoughts, but it was certainly, you know, high up on, on the list of considerations. Again, talking about Israel, they have five seawater desal plants along the Mediterranean. They feel that they have no choice but to, ch but to turn to the Mediterranean. But if climate change is going to mean that we're going to have periods of a lot of rain and flooding and then periods of long droughts, um, are the cities in, in, in Australia that have done the seawater desal plants at all concerned that these will be <laughs> stranded assets, or at least for a period of time? Um, well, a few elements of that. The first, I guess, is that seawater desalination became the first option because of the political process, which meant that we waited and we relied on, on our restrictions in our controlling approach until the last moment to act. And I guess that's one of the lessons I think that can be learned from the Australian um, example. Not that desalination is necessarily good or bad. All of the, of the um, considerations are, are local, but we waited until there was no time to do anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, then we turned to the private sector in almost every case to within two years go from a cold start to an operating plant. Um, average time turned out about 26 months for the good ones. So we, we put ourselves there. As I said, we hit a, we hit a crisis. Some little paradox in that, in Brisbane, during the, both of the floods of the last two years, one of them record, it's actually been the desalination plant running at 100% to compensate for the conventional water treatment plants that, that couldn't manage the turbidity in the, in the contaminated water, which was strange. Um, I do agree that, that a balanced approach is much, uh, much more effective if you have the political will to start early and to make, make the work. And I guess um, what five minutes didn't allow me to, to try and draw from the examples is that Brisbane quickly moved to a very large centralised recycled water system, one that's never seen more than 20% use and, and one that uh, is, in, well, is likely to be shut down, um, like most of the desalination plants now that it's rained. We've had record floods in the last two years that ended the drought, hence the quote of droughts and flooding rains. Um, Sydney took a sort of middle ground where Sydney did desalination and also did a range of recycling projects looking at um, environmental discharges in order to supplant uh, water storage looking at industrial reuse uh, and importantly bringing in private sector competition under the Wicker Act, the Water Industry Competition Act, to encourage private investment in water recycling to bring innovation and to bring the capacity for delivery. Melbourne um, has taken the third path and this is why the three are different. Melbourne went very long with a very large desalination plant and cut themselves some time and are now focusing very much on an integrated water cycle management, a distributed system approach. 
all cities are looking at all options, but it was quite interesting to see that we were forced um, by our own hand into the desalination choice. We're now stepping back and thinking about water efficiency and making water available for economic growth and doing it in a much more planned manner. And that's been the benefit of, of our 10 years of experience and I guess part of the message and the learning that, uh, that perhaps can be, can be collected here. Thank you very much. Um, David, I, I wonder if I, can, if I can take you out of the, the kind of strict water world uh, for, for a second and, and get your opinion on something. Again, coming back to Los Angeles, you know, we know that we're going to be affected by climate change and that we have to adapt to it, that we're going to be victims of it because of sea level rise, because of droughts, uh, uh, you know, wildfires and so on. But, but I think we've also recognized that we're culprits because, because of our dependence principally on coal. And this is why, while I was there and now recently was confirmed that LA is going to get off coal altogether. Uh, we will have, by the year 2025, no coal in our energy portfolio whatsoever. And that's kind of our way of saying that we don't want to be contributors to the problem. What about New York? Um, you know, you've, you've talked about the effects that climate change are going to have, you know, the hurricanes and so on and so forth. What, what, what does New York do in order to lessen its contribution, its impact, as far as climate change is concerned? Well, there have been a number of initiatives, um, uh, particularly under the Bloomberg administration. Um, there's been a, a heavy focus on uh, increasing energy efficiency, um, uh, both in terms of uh, local air quality uh, within the city, um, as well as just uh, sort of greenhouse gas uh, trends. Um, there's a movement away from the current uh, heating oil uh, standard, uh, number six oil within the city. Um, although that has opened up a very interesting um, aspect in the dialogue in terms of increasing production of natural gas. Um, people who are from the region will know that um, our department has taken a very active stance against uh, natural gas exploration using high volume hydrofracking within our watershed area because of concerns about um, water, possible water contamination for our unfiltered supply. Um, and balancing that message with the overall administration's message on increased um, reliance on natural gas uh, here in the city as an as a energy source has been something of a tricky um, message to manage. Um, and I hope I didn't say anything that will just get me in trouble. Um, so, so there have been a number of initiatives, um, and there's a real recognition um, within the administration that the importance we have been working at our wastewater plants. Um, uh, Rod's firm uh, has been helping us with the OPEX initiative, operational excellence, um, looking to increase, uh, sorry, decrease uh, energy consumption at the plants, um, uh, looking for efficiencies there. Um, so a ho whole range of things that are ongoing currently recognizing the conne connection between the kinds of impacts that we've just seen in Sandy and the overall carbon cycle. Okay. Great, thank you. Right, I'm going to turn now to, to questions from the audience, uh, all of which are remarkably intelligent and co cogent and very germane to the topic. So thank you. Um, I'm going I'm, I'm to start with one that has to do with the water energy nexus. And the question is, in the water energy nexus cycle, because we haven't really covered this, technology solutions lead to higher energy consumption. Can you discuss tech solutions that, in fact, reduce energy use? And Gretchen, could you take that? Oh, sure. I mean, and I am sure there's several that we could talk about. But I'll just use an example in a wastewater treatment facility. You know, the biggest consumer of energy is usually the second stage of wastewater treatment. And there's, you know, fine aeration bubbles there that are coming up in, and you're also using mixers and blowers, and it's a large energy consumer. If you think about that system as a system and not you know, as just the treatment solution, but you put analytical equipment there that's giving you the oxygen level of that water and you're putting your mixers and your blowers in a system where it's getting real-time feedback, you can reduce the energy consumption of that secondary treatment stage by 50%. We've tested it, we've worked with um, many of our customers around that, and that's just a key example of reducing the energy efficiency. The other area, and this goes to what Veolia, Veolia is doing, as well as we're working with many of our customers, going in and doing audits of their facilities, understanding where they've got energy leakage, and helping them ultimately you know, bring in new technology and equipment to bring that cost of maintenance down, then that frees up money ultimately to be able to upgrade in other areas or put other technologies you use to expand if it's a growth initiative. Okay. 
Great. Um, this question is clearly from a student, so I, I want to pose it to the whole panel. Uh, the question is, what kinds of skills and credentials are most in demand in the water resource management industry? I'll jump in with one. Which I'll come back to systems engineering, broader thinking, thinking about the interconnections of, of how a system works. Um, yes, I think you know the water industry requires a good technical background in terms of, of, of the expertise in which you're working, but the ability to see that bigger picture and optimize the system, not optimize the particular component, is so critically important. And program management, managing these projects because they're getting bigger and the issues are getting more complex, being able to program manage that. So good technical skills from a background and good program management skills would be my, okay. my input. Uh, go to in a different direction? Sure, absolutely. Go ahead. I guess, yeah, I think um, I, I agree that we need those program and technical skills. I think what we've seen in the last few years is, by and large, we have the capacity to do these things. We said that um, earlier. What we perhaps lack is the will, um, is the social will, is the political will. So I think, and, and maybe it's because most of us in, in the industry are engineers, and, and some of us quite proud of, of Dilbert cartoons, we are a bit short on people who can engage socially and can communicate effectively and thoroughly about water issues. People who have the presence, the patience and the capability to influence ourselves. We as an industry are very resistant to change. Um, people who are prepared to lead. Leadership I think is, is somewhere something that we value highly because it's, uh, it's a little bit rare. And people who are able to communicate um, and change the mind of the community. To me, the greatest impact can be had by changing the minds of people. We have the technology, we need the will. We're all about fairness. Thank you.